And good afternoon, everyone. Good evening to those in the UK. Welcome, welcome back. Um, we are settling in. Um, yeah, I got some stuff to show you. Uh, there was a... Uh, well, I'll explain it when I show you. Anyway, we're going to be um, actually doing a 543 today. Um, I know I promised that um, we would be working on the Cincinnati painting today, but uh, that is part of the show and tell. So we'll get that going and um, yeah, uh, we'll take a look at the, uh, we're going we're gonna to work with um, this kind of cool, I've been using this for a little while. This is the uh, Chroma Air paint from Spray Gunner down in uh, Florida. And this is the aluminum. It's a lot like the um, Quicksilver Chrome. So we're going to be using this today on one of the 543s. I thought it'd be a fun one because I've never done that kind of stuff with you guys. And I can get something done. So that's that's a bonus. All right. So we're going to switch cameras around, get right to it. Um, I think I'm just going to work till it's done because I got to get it done anyway. So we'll see how long it takes. And that's what I got. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Switch to... Um, this one and that'll work. Yeah. Yeah. I'll switch to this one because I can get some stuff. Ian, how's it going, buddy? Um, to all my UKers, I'm sorry. Uh, this is, we're going to do this the right way. So this is Chroma Air or yeah, Chroma Air paint from uh, Spray Gunner. And um, for all my UK friends, I will pronounce it the UK way throughout the entire feed, which is aluminium extra letters there but we won't get into that today's uh, cheers i've decided that it's thursday i've done all my running around so i'm going to cheer proper with with all my uk friends dan what's up buddy um so today's cheers is going to be i was super happy when i found this this morning uh this is mastheads jalapeno ipa uh, they do make a double ipa jalapeno beer which is even better but uh from what i was hearing it's seasonal so when I saw this, I was super excited because I thought this, the regular IPA, was also seasonal. And uh, apparently not because they had it on the shelf. So I'm really, really happy. So I bought that. And like I said, I've already done my running around. I'm not going anywhere this afternoon. So I will have a proper cheers with you all. Because it's been one hell of a week. And I'll show you why in a second. All right. Chroma Air, we got that out of the way. Um, yeah, I didn't grab it. Um, for anyone who missed my any of my posts this morning, uh, today is the final day of the Pyrol Red Series. I'm going to go grab one of those paintings real quick. Hold tight. Sorry about that. I was going to grab this before the feed started, but I forgot. Astro, what's up, buddy? Um, so here is, this is, this is That Way. The name of the painting is That Way. And this is my um, 63 Impala. So I did the series of six paintings with uh, Createx Pyrol Red, uh, which I really like. And um, there's a massive discount on all of these paintings. Uh, and the thing is, is it it ends today uh, for a leap day. Um, so after today, they go back up to the regular price. Um, even with the insane international shipping, which is always a, a problem, uh, these are still worth it. They're almost half off what they normally are right now. Uh, so I just thought I'd uh, kind of mention that today. There are four left out of the series, and uh, and I love all of them. So uh, so no matter which one you grab. Um, you'll be happy. And they are, like I said, they're all framed and ready to go. So that is that way. That's it. That's it. That's all I got for show and tell except for this. <laughs> so you guys are the first, first, well, almost the first humans to see this. So, you know, I was working on, if you were here Monday, I started the, um, the Cincinnati painting that I'm trying to get done for a show that is uh, coming up. It's the show's actually in August, but the call for entry for it is in March. It's really early. I wasn't prepared for that. And so I was going to make sure I had the painting done. And then I realized it was March 10th. <coughs> so excuse me. And then it got crazy. So um, Hunky Dory, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. I'm going to have to look that up. I don't know where Hunky Dory comes from either. 
That's like the, the uh, Cody, what's up, buddy? It's like uh, the saying, you know, a um, hundred ways to skin a cat. Like who was ever skinning cats? I just, I don't get that one either. But anyway, Monday, we started working on that um, Cincinnati project and I burned that thing to the ground. I knew I'd be working on it flat out, um, but I didn't expect to be, I didn't expect to pull the days that I did, but, uh, but it is done. So here's the backside and here's what this painting looks like. And it is all done. I'm going to get you guys close. I don't have the super jumbo lens, but this will still give you a pretty good idea of what's happening with this painting. So it's two and a half inches by four and a half inches, which is the normal size for these, um, these uh, cityscape paintings that I do. And, uh, and I was just like, Super, super happy to finish this up uh, last night. It was uh, three, basically three really, really, really long days. And, um, and the problem with doing that with these paintings is that the fatigue is real, like the eye fatigue and even, you know, the, the small motor muscle fatigue and all that. So pulling that off was, was crazy. But I think it was, you know, it came out, it came out good. I was happy with it. Yeah, Simon, it's super ahead of schedule, which is great because I still got to make the frame for this, which I've already cut the frame rails, which I'll show you in a second. And I've already got the asphalt for the backdrop, uh, but I still got to make the frame. So now I can work on that this weekend, which I was going to do anyway, but now I don't have to worry about getting this done. And um, yeah, give me two seconds here. I'm going to switch you out to this camera for a second. I'll switch to the Jumbo Mega Super Lens because it's worth it for this painting because uh, there's there's a lot going on with it. And like I said, you guys are the first to see it. I finished it late last night and um, yeah, pretty happy. Let's see what we got here. This is the macro lens, so we should be able to get much closer. Oh yeah, yeah, much closer. So this is what's going on with this one. Yeah, there's a whole ton of ton of crap in this. All the way from the parked cars in the parking lot right down in here. The little gravel barge there at the bottom. I love the, the way the bridge came out. Um, this is a Paycor, I think it's Paycor Field or Paycor Stadium um, where the Cincinnati Bengals play. And then the Great American Ballpark is over here. That's where the Cincinnati Reds play. And of course, this is Cincinnati. And the fun part about this painting is right at the tip of my fingernail there is that little church spire. So that is uh, St. Francis. And St. Francis is on the same street that the gallery is on that this painting will hopefully be in. Um, so it's kind of neat. It's kind of the whole, the whole deal. So what we did Monday was we did um, the, the water which now you can see it's like that deep, deep, like olive greenish color. And I finished the river up on the top too on Monday. Now I didn't do anything else to the river. So if you want to see how that came together, you can check out the feed from Monday. But, uh, but that's it. That's the, that's the deal right there. It's a whole lot of everything. So anyway, that is it. Now from, like I said, from here, what I'll be doing is I will, um, I'll build a frame for that. I'll switch it back out to here. I'll build a frame for that over the weekend. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that goes into that. Let me show you the, get rid of this lens so I don't damage it because we don't want that. Oops, I get this, get this one all set up again. Okay, but good. Oh, thanks Astro, thanks so much. Yeah, Cody, the idea was that painting was supposed to be the next uh, open studio um, after the razor blade painting, which if you joined me last night, thank you. We were working on that again. Um, so we'll have that done shortly. But that Cincinnati painting was supposed to be the next open studio. However, when I got the deadline and realized the deadline was so much quicker than I thought it was, um, that isn't true. So what I may end up doing, Cody, is I may end up the next, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get the next cityscape ready. And, um, and, and that will be the next open studio, which I started Chicago and I never finished it. So the only problem with doing that is 
The open studio is nice because it's from really from the very beginning all the way through, but I've already started the Chicago paintings, so I don't know that I want to do that, but in, I can always just, you know, pick another city too. Seattle was on the list and all that fun stuff. Anyway, here is what I chose for the wood for this, which is coffee wood, which looks kind of greenish uh, when you... Um, when it's all finished up, it's kind of a it's kind of this olivey green color, which I think will really play off well with the um, with the water in the painting and the overall blue color. Uh, this is totally rough right now, so these pieces are cut, but they're not finished, obviously. So what in what needs to happen is I need to put this all together, make sure it's all glued together, and then I just sand and finish it till it's like shiny. It's beautiful, really, really neat wood. So that's the, the wood I chose for that. It's also super hard. It's like really hard. And then for the background for that, I have two pieces of asphalt from the street right outside the gallery, which is a blast. And, I, and again, this, pa this painting has been planned since last year. So I really knew that, you know, how I wanted to take it. And um, so what I got to do next with this stuff is just smash it up. I just, you know, get a sledgehammer and grind it up into small bits. And uh, then that becomes the background of the painting. Um, and that's it. Once all that's done, it gets all put together. And then um, I'll post it for everyone. But um, I will definitely have it done now in time for the show. I know, coffee. I've already had a few cups, or a couple cups anyway. Franz, what's up, buddy? All right, so that's all the show and tell. Thank you for hanging in with me for that. So what we're going to do today is um, I actually thought that I'd be working on that Cincinnati painting all week and all weekend. So I honestly thought that I wasn't going to have any 543s for Monday, which is the first time that would have happened. But as a result, um, I finished it, so I, I, I'm going to be in good shape. So one of the suggestions... do I? Oh, I have them right here. I was going to say I don't have it. Wait a minute. Oh, it's Enzo. Okay. Yeah, our buddy Enzo suggested the uh, Assassin's Creed logo, but in 3D. So I thought that would be a fun one to do. And this is the kind of the just a quick uh, thing I grabbed off online for this. So we're going to change this a lot, but I just needed the overall shape for that. And I thought it'd be great to kick it up a little bit by doing it in like a metallic chrome. And so that's where this whole thing came from. So it'll be good because I'll be able to show you how I do this. And this is essentially the same thing I do with uh, the gold leaf, which I think we've done here on the Thursday feed, um, which I will do if we, if we haven't uh, at some point. But uh, it's this is the same basic method that I use for gold leaf. The only difference is instead of, you know, the gluing and leafing, I just use the paint. That is just as good as I remembered it. Oh, that's so good. All right. Ooh, spicy too. So again, the way these work, just um, a little bit of UPO paper, which has already been primed with the Autoborn Sealer Gray. This batch came out really, really good. There's almost nothing on, oh, let me do this. Almost nothing on this, meaning like little nibs, but I'll still sand this, but for the most part, uh, it came out really, this, this batch came out good. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Because I, I'd sand them anyway, so I'm not like super careful when I'm spraying them because I don't care. Yeah, you know, because I'm going to be working on them anyway. If you guys have any questions, just yell them out. Um, oh, I forgot to do this. Since he is jumping around, let's see. Let's put... Let's put Cody on. There you go, Cody. Now you're, you're, uh, you're an admin for the feed. So you can, uh, you have the power now. You can, um, you can do all kinds of fun stuff to people. Just be nice. <laughs> and you're responsible for getting rid of any spam bots that show up. Um, all right. And uh, if you have to go, Cody, just, uh, that's totally cool. Uh, you don't have to, you know, it's totally fine. I just like to, uh, one of the perks of being a member now is uh, your, uh, any of the members can be chosen for admin duties on a live feed. So you, you can help me out. You can, uh, anyone can answer questions, but, uh, but you know, you, you have, the, you have the, the power now. So you have the wrench. All right, so first thing um, is just sand with a thousand grit sandpaper. This takes off any of the big ridges and the, you know, any of the nibs and anything. Like I said, this is in pretty good shape, so I don't have to do too much. And then I have my Scotch-Brite pad, which isn't really a Scotch-Brite pad. It's more like 2000 grit 
because it's so old, but that's the way I like it. And just gonna clean that up, keeping my greasy mitts off it. That's it. Wipe off the residual powder, which is really, really nice. The way this stuff sands, so it sands to a powder. You can see it on the top of my sweatshirt here. Uh, it just, oh, it's so nice. It's like super nice. And then I have my handy dandy 543 holder. Just put that up there. I need my FBS tape. Oh, incidentally, this is kind of what we're talking about. This is the Halo helmet from Monday, and the visor is copper leaf. So the way I did the copper leaf and the way I set it up is exactly how I'm going to set up this painting today. So it'll give you a good idea of how I kind of mask it off without, you know, too much trouble. All right. Am I still blowing your screen too? Yeah, yeah. So you, any of the members will still stay blue. You'll just get that fancy wrench. And uh, I guess there's, you, you probably have, like if you click on someone's name, there's probably, uh, well, I know there's additional options, um, but I don't really know what they are because I've never been an admin or, you know, on a, uh, a moderator on a, on a feed. So I don't really know what that panel looks like, but that's what I hire you guys for. <laughs> you guys can figure it out and then let me know. All right, this is FBS KUTG Gold, which I love a lot because it's a great masking tape. It's not super sticky, but it's uh, really thin and it, um, it does a good job of kind of keeping the bleed down and it's not always a huge pain edge if you're doing a bunch of stuff because it's so thin. Just really great stuff overall. This comes in all different thicknesses, as you're going to see, or widths, as you, you're going to see. Uh, the, what I use for the 543s is just half inch. It just makes it easy because these are four by five sheets of UPO that I've cut up. And when I put the masking on it, it makes it three by four. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, how, that's how it goes. So, oh, is that true? Yeah, look at that. Simon's got it too. All right, well, we got two today. I didn't realize you got, you, you, I thought it ended at the feed, but you both have the power. Everyone has the power. See, I'm learning stuff all the time. All the time. All right, so what I'm gonna do next is back you guys out a little bit so you can see the whole thing, kind of what I'm doing. So now I've got this little bit of extra on the outside edge of the UPO. Is that in focus? Probably not. No. Nope. Should turn on the autofocus, but I know what's going to happen if I do. It's going to be all wonky. All right. So I'm going to trim off the excess here because I don't need it. Oops. A little bit on the outside there. There we go. That comes off like that. And this thing is ready to go. Ta-da! All ready to go. So this goes up on the little holder here. Some light on the subject. Move this back around so you guys aren't so wonky. You're both good cop. Yeah, that's for sure. You guys are both good cops, which is fine by me. All right, we'll get this focused up. Excellent day. All right. Is it vertical? Probably. Of course it is. All right. So that's the logo, what we got. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to make a mask because I need to, um, I may be able to get away with this really quick, so it will be good. So I need a mask to kind of, to kind of spray the chrome in. Um, and I could use the photocopy, but I'd rather have a clean edge on this, so I'm going to use adhesive mask for this, which isn't something I normally do on 543s unless there's a big field of like chrome or gold or the leaf, for instance. Um, so I think that's what we're going to do. So here's how I would do this without having a cut on this. I'll move this aside for a second because I don't need it, but I do need one of these. So cut out a few of these. few of these. 
There are different versions of this Assassin's Creed logo. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I was going to pick a kind of you know intricate one, but again, then the problem with that is you know I try to keep them to a certain time frame. So the more intricate, the more um, the the more time it's going to take, and then I, it kind of defeats the purpose of these things. So they're supposed to be fast, so I can put them up at a, a lower price than I would normally put stuff up as. All right, so what I'm going to do is uh, take a look at this real quick. I got that and that. I'm just looking for places that are going to be an issue, which looks pretty good. So I'm going to cut this out, get you guys in closer. I'm afraid. I'm going to do it. Let's see what happens. Hold on, you're going to... What the heck? -o? I don't want that. Oh, I know what to do. Sorry. All right, we'll try it. Let's see what autofocus does for me. All right, so, uh, yeah, so I'm just going to cut out this logo real quick. Again, had I not been doing all that other stuff, I probably could have had this prepped beforehand, but to be honest, I really, you know, after finishing that last night, I hadn't. I'm like, okay, because honestly, I, I was planning on working on the Cincinnati painting with you guys today. I thought it's, ow, close. I thought I was still going to be working on it, but as it turned out, I don't have to because it's done. This blade is toast. Wow, this blade is terrible. I just used this. What is going on with this? Unless it's the... So, it feels like I'm cutting on gravel when I'm cutting through this, and it shouldn't ever feel like that. It should feel super, like, it feels really smooth when it's working. Sometimes, or after a certain amount of time, these cutting mats dry out, believe it or not. So when they start out, they're really soft and pliable, but as they get older, they tend to harden up. And that's how I know when I need to replace them. This might be at that point because that's what it feels like. So yes, cutting mats are not, you know, really forever. Unless you're doing like, if you're doing like, if you're cutting mat board or something like that, and you're just looking to protect the blade, then, you know, you can keep a mat. Like I would never cut out or throw out a, uh, yeah, this, this something's wrong here. Um, I would never throw one of these out because you, you can always use them for something else. But for this kind of precision cutting, you need, you need a little bit of softness to it. It's why I like these R tool ones uh, because what happens is you're just kind of pushing the blade through the paper, and it kind of it kind of pushes the mat a little bit, the cutting mat, without digging into it, and uh, and that's what gives you those super super tiny cuts. If the if you're cutting on glass or something like that, or or a mat cutting mat that's really really hard. Uh, it, it, first of all, it kills the blade really fast, the tip of the blade. Uh, but it also doesn't give you that, that, you know, that little bit of give, which lets you really do those really super fine cuts. What else we got? I need to do it back yesterday. It feels like you rocked in 24 hours. Yeah, it worked out to be about 30 hours altogether, but it was 30 hours over three days or two and a half days. So, yeah, it was, it was crazy. And it's not the mat, it was the blade, which is weird because I was just using that blade. I don't know. So the tip broke off and I didn't notice it. Yeah, I mean, I didn't work on it with the intent to finish it in three days. And if you had asked me when I started, uh, there was no way I was going to get that done in three days. But uh, I, I just got in a, a zone and, you know, there, there wasn't really any distractions or anything. So... I just uh, kind of kept going till it was done, and it was it was good. Uh, yeah. So I know what you're wondering. If you haven't seen me do this before, you're like, "Why are you cutting this out if you're going to use an adhesive mask?" And I will show you in a second. So there are lots of ways to do what I'm going to show you here. This is the way I do it because I'm really, really comfortable with, with the knife. 
and uh, I get I feel like I get the best results with the knife so the other way to do this is to just put a piece of graphite paper or Sorrel paper underneath this and just trace it and then recut it but um, I'll show you why I like this method a little bit better when I get it cut out there we go so that's the outside did I get yeah there we go good now I just got to cut out the inside here Scott would have had it sliced in three seconds oh with a uh, plotter yeah yeah that's if you that's what you're talking about astral yeah if you load that into a plotter or, you know you yeah, you're right you could uh, you could have a cut in no time, and then do you eliminate the, all the steps? I mean, if you did this digitally and then and then had a cut on a plotter, you would plot it. You would cut it into the mask itself. So, um, and we do have a really nice plotter. We actually have the same plotter that Scott has here, the Roland uh, GX24. But uh, it's up in Marge's studio, and uh, she's kind of redoing her studio right now. So I'm not going to bug her. So there's the positive. I'm going to hold on to that. And then this is the negative and the middle. So I need both of those. So it doesn't take me long to cut stuff out, which is why I don't really mind doing it. But like I said, there are lots of ways to do this. So let me put this back up here so you can see it. All right. I don't even need this yet, but OK. Um, yeah, I don't need this yet. So we're going to transfer this onto the mask. And what I'm going to use for masking material, as I said earlier, KUTG Gold comes in all different sizes. So this is a six inch roll, but it's the same stuff. It's just on a backing paper. So it's the same stuff as this. Comes in, like I said, all different, all different widths, which is really, really cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a piece that's roughly the size of the 543. about here okay I don't need this for the moment put that aside and I'm just gonna put this down here that put a couple pieces of magnets on here so this whole thing <laughs> is more more prep than paint really but it's okay all right so I'm going to center this on here and I'm going to drop the rest of the magnets on here and hold it down I'm going to show you the other way real quick too uh, no I'm not because I don't have Sorrel paper over here the other way to do it is to just put the the Sorrel paper on first and put the photocopy on it and then just trace it out and then you have to cut it so but I'll show you why I like this method a little bit better. So even though I have to cut it twice, where did it happen in the middle? There we go. And I want to make sure I get the middle in the right spot. So I'll put this back in for a second. Lovely. Put the middle back in where that should be. I got a few magnets on this. I can take out the cutout. That, that's good. Beauties. And that's it. That's all I need to do. So now I'll just grab the airbrush. All right, a little bit of black. Wait, what did I miss? Ian. Uh, I'm having to watch this without sound as the wife is watching something and the granddaughter is using my laptop. <laughs> nice, Ian. Ian, this is for you. <laughs> All right. So a little bit of a... Uh, oops, I'm not getting any black here. Just need a little bit of black. Any color will work. I happen to have black here, so. And I'm just gonna kind of go over this real quick to spray it in. And I don't have to be super careful, I just want to make sure I have the edges really like visible. And you don't have to 
I don't have to make it like black either, you know. I just need to be able to see it to cut it out again. Okay, that should be good. The other thing I should do, which I could have done before, but I didn't, was to mark the corners. So I'm just going to do that now. Take off a couple of the... So I'm just going to kind of look at the corner here. Figure out where it is. So just help me line it up after. It doesn't have to be perfect at all, especially for this. It's just I need a rough idea. That's good. All right, so now what I got is... Try to save these bits and pieces. So now I have, oops, one more. There we go. So now I have the, the image on the, on the mask. So now I can cut the mask out. So this works out for me a little bit nicer because this is super clean and super crisp. If I use Sorrel paper and then trace it through, I'd have to refine and clean up that drawing anyway. So it's just a matter of like what, what you enjoy doing more. You know what I mean? So if I transfer it with Sorrel paper, then I have to clean it up when I cut it. With this method, I, I'm ready to go, you know? So I do have to cut it twice, but like I said, I like cutting stuff, so it's, it's working out pretty well. Oh, Ian's, there we go. I've done this only a couple times. I'm always concerned about cutting the substrate. Yeah, that's one of the things, uh, that's the reason why I do all of this. So the other way to do it, obviously, is to take this mask, spread it out on the, the, the paper or your substrate, and then cut it out on the substrate, and you eliminate the step of having to put it down even as I mean I've been doing this forever and even with that all it takes is just a little bit of extra pressure and you'll put a cut in the substrate underneath as you're trying to cut the mask I do it all the time so for me I don't even want to take that chance because what happens is then you'll always see that like the 543s that I have where did it go yeah like this so this has a satin you guys have super exposure here. Let me uh, turn that down a bit. So if you see the satin finish on this, as I roll that, that out, that the highlight across, you can see the edge where the, where the thickness of the gold or copper leaf is, but all those other sections have no, you can't see any cut lines because there aren't any. But if I cut this on the, on the UPO, you would see all the cut lines. And I just don't like that look. Plus, in an automotive situation, having cut lines in the substrate is bad because they all, you have all kinds of problems down the road. So, Mr. Mountain, what is up? All right. So now, now we just gotta. Now, if I cut through the paper, if I cut too deep on this, it's not a big deal. You know what I mean? Because I'm just cutting the backing paper. I don't want to cut the backing paper. But, um, but if it happens, it's not a big deal. All right, so now I can just carefully cut this out. I do want to be careful when I'm cutting this part out because this is the edge that's going to be on the painting. This is the final edge. So again, if I had a drawing on here that was just kind of you know rough, like this, what the Sorrel would give me, uh, I'd have to refine it with the knife blade while I was working. And, and I don't know, this just seems like it's... For me, it's easier to just like see the the edge that I really need to uh, to follow, instead of having to be like, okay, well, I got to clean that up and I got to clean up that curve. And I should have grabbed the Sorrel so you could see what I'm talking about, but hopefully you understand. Like, you know, any kind of like the old carbon paper, you know, trick. That's that's what you get. You know, you get a kind of a loose drawing when you're done. And and and. Well, that's a good thing. Like if you if you all you need is like a loose reference, then the Sorrel paper or the copy paper is is a, is brilliant because it, that's exactly what it gives you. It just gives you a real kind of a loose, you know, non-specific type of drawing. But for this, because everything's so like crisp and and really like right on the money. Uh, I, that, this, this method for me just works a little bit better. Again, like Astral had said, if I had a plotter, the plotter would have done all of this for me. I just would have imported the file, cleaned it up, did a few things to it, and then 
how to cut out everything for me. So the, the, what it boils down to is that it's, I, I feel like the plotter is one of those things. Do I need that? No. Um, like it's one of those things that if you have it, you'll use it all the time. You know, that kind of thing. So if you don't feel like you have a need for what I already did that. Um, if you don't feel like you have a need for it, it's one of those things that you'd still find you'd be using it all the time. Um, however, for what I do, there are there aren't that many uh, uh, opportunities, or, or or there's not a whole lot, a whole need a lot. Bleh. There isn't a big need for it for me, because I don't do a lot of you know lettering or real tight graphic work like you know like this. You look at what Scott does, how he's taken that you know the plotter image, and he's able to then paint in a real painterly way with it, use it as a guide, which I I really like that. Mike Learn is uh, the master of that as well. And uh, what I find the plotter excels at in that instance where you're using it as a drawing guide, you know, just to kind of lay things out, is you can continuously cut out more of them, you know? And that's great. So say you're doing something where you have uh, an image, it needs to be similar but not the same, but you can just, you can just re recut it out, which is nice. Oops, switch over. The line that serial or copy paper leaves freaks me out. I always think I'll struggle to cover it or have to pain lift where the line was. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. What did I already cut out here? Did I cut that whole thing? I did. Ha ha. I just don't know what I've cut out. We'll find out when I pull this because sooner or later I'll get to a point where I haven't cut yet. You... Uh, you can try to save this too, but it's so, the KUTG gold is so thin, I, I, I just assume that I'm not going to be able to save it. I cut this whole thing out. How did I do that and not even know it? All right, so there's my mask. It's all ready to go. See, and it's like, like I said, so I could have kind of wrestled with it and, you know, did the Sorrel trick and then have to, you know, use the ruler and everything, but it just works out faster for me this way. All right. Now. The question is, how do you get this onto the UPO? Because you can't, you can't peel it off like a sticker and put it down because it's too thin. So it needs help, and that's what this stuff is for. This is transfer paper, which is really neat. It's like, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, um, like a thinner paper with adhesive on the back. And it's not very sticky. It's, it's just kind of there. And this is the stuff that they use in the vinyl sign shop industry for putting letters onto vehicles or whatever, or signs. So I'm going to grab a piece of this. Oops, I know where to put this. Put it right there. All right, so grab a piece of this. Like I said, it's really thin. You can actually see through it. People use this as masking material as well because it's see-through, which makes it really kind of neat. Uh, but what it's intended for, and again, it's called transfer paper because that's what it does. It transfers vinyl onto other stuff, or in this case, tape. So I'm just going to squeegee this on with my finger, and I'm going to make sure that it's on there with an actual squeegee. <laughs> that's funny. I am on autopilot astral. <laughs> So this is a this is a uh, vinyl applicator squeegee, super cheap. You can get them anywhere where they sell vinyl equipment. You should have one anyway because I use it for all kinds of stuff. So it just um, gets gets that masking on there really nice. And just to make my life easy, I'm going to trim this down a little bit so I don't have the sticky bit on the edge to kind of get in the way. Like that. Okay, so that's what I got. Grab my 543, which is here. And now to get this onto this, this is the fun part. So I have little corners here. Again, with this logo, all I got to do is make sure it's roughly in the center. Um, I mean, I set it up, you know, as, as a specific kind of angle and everything, but it doesn't really have to be exactly there. I'm just going to make sure I'm not too close to the edge anywhere. And I'm just going to drop a couple magnets on this to do the next part which is the tape part. So now I need some decent tape. So I'm going to use the uh, 3M masking tape. This is a lot higher adhesive than everything else. And I'm going to put uh, a strip of tape on this side, just like that. 
that. <clears throat> Take these magnets off now. I want to make sure that my 543 doesn't move underneath, which it shouldn't. So now what I can do is I can flip this over, peel off the backing, and, oops, I'll try to peel off the backing. There we go. So peel off the backing, and this thing's ready to go. So now you see all like the center piece stays in and everything's where it should be. So the trick here is you want to just kind of, you don't want to pull real tight. This is a small mask, so it's not going to make a difference. But on a bigger mask, if you pull from one point like this, you're going to put like this V-shaped stress into it. And then as you're putting this on, you're going to get all kinds of wrinkles underneath. So you just kind of want to keep it up off the surface. Let it kind of start on the surface and then just really just kind of gently put this down. And once it's on there, then you can kind of go to town and squeegee it down and make sure everything's on there. Now, the nice thing is, is that's exactly where I needed it to be. It's, I didn't have to, I didn't have to try to like jimmy it around and then stick it down and have air bubbles and everything. By putting it down that way, this thing is going to be right where I needed it to be. And there won't be any air bubbles or anything like that. Let's be ready to rock. Ta-da! I'm going to leave all of the mask on too just because. All right. <clears throat> there is a method to my madness. I don't know what that is, but there is. What did I just drop? I dropped something. It sounded important. I'll probably find it later. All right. All right. So this, um, the, the aluminum, the CA200 from Chroma, Chroma Air, is, like I said, it works, it works really the same as the... Um, Quicksilver Chrome from Createx. Uh, so what I'm going to do first before I put the... I could put this stuff down right away. Yeah, and you know what? All right, I'm going to tell you the right way to do this, and then I'm, we're going to do it the wrong way. <laughs> the reason why we're going to do it the wrong way is because it's faster. And so for a 543, faster is better. But the way you really want to use this stuff is this, this looks best on a glossy surface like a real smooth, glossy surface. So if I really want this to look amazing, what I would do is I would pick a glossy black paint to put down first. Uh, for instance, like the high gloss paint from Createx. Uh, that would give me a real smooth, shiny surface. Then I put this stuff on and it looks like just a million bucks. This is still gonna look really, really good without the black, but removing that step just kind of, you know, it saves a bunch of time because what we would have to do then is we would spray the black, let it let it dry, spray it again, let it dry. And, you know, to get the full effect, it's just going to take a lot longer. And we don't have a long time to do this, right? We're trying to get it done within two hours. Oh, spastics. Yeah, there's so many good chrome paints out there now. I love it. And before, that was never the case. It was always like, you know... Um, there just wasn't any good ones. All right. So with any of these metallic paints, you just got to make sure it's really, really well shaken because they separate like crazy. So even if you shook it at the beginning of your session, just keep shaking it before you use it every time. And uh, you will be a happy camper. So for this, I'm going to... Uh, oh, I'm actually going to reduce this a little bit too. Um... So I just kind of put that in the brush. This is a Creos PS289. I got this from also from Spray Gutter. Uh, and I'm going to reduce this with 4011 Reducer because I want to. And I don't have any reducer from Chroma Air. <laughs> so I want this fairly thin. I mean, not super thin because we're looking for coverage on this too. Now this stuff is neat. Uh, all these metallic paints, almost all of them, you start really light. You, you know, you put on light coats, real controlled coats. Nothing looks like it's happening. And then like after the third or fourth coat, it like lights up like it should. Now, again, we're putting this on a gray sealer base. So you're not going to see much until it's done. Yeah, DuPont. Yeah, and who made, um, who, uh, who made the, um, the real mirrored chrome first? It was like this whole system. I forget who it was now. And if someone says it, I'll be like, uh, that's definitely it. Um, they were the only game in town. And it was like, if you had, you had a, yeah, like two guns and there was a really super specific way to do it. And if you didn't do it this way, it looked like ass. And I don't know. 
Thank you, Astral. Yes, please hit the like. All right, so there's, there's the chrome. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep it kind of far back. And I'm just going to put a really light coat and about a 50% overlap as I'm, as I'm doing this. And that's it. I got to let it um, let it dry. The silvering process hit the automotive market using water and the silver chemical deposition. That is awesome. Yeah, what was the name of that company? Damn it. Oh, they were huge in the 90s. And they, I guess the, I never used it, but I guess the, the system was like super picky. All right, so let that dry. But even now, even on that first pass, it's starting to uh, look shiny. What? Oh, I taped to that. I get it. Like, what is that? All right, so that should be enough time because that, that first pass was pretty thin. So go again. Same again. The, uh, the tendency for me is to want to hammer the thing and get it all on there. But I, you really, I really try to, go, try to avoid that. Because this stuff looks so much better when it's just built up by multiple layers than try to like hit opacity or something right off the right off the um, bat. Um, Easy Chrome. No, it was called. Um, where's Scott when I need him? <laughs> um, damn it. I'll remember it after the feed. Yeah, exactly. That's 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 exactly the one. Um, yeah, you had to use their system and do you ever use a hair dryer between layers? Thomas, awesome, welcome. Um, no, not anymore. Um, because the auto air used to need heat to cross length, so all little fibers in the paint needed to heat up so that they would kind of mesh together. The new Wicked doesn't need that. Um, so this and I've always worked in such light layers anyway, they're almost dry anyway. So um, so no, I, I don't I don't really have to do that. But that's an awesome question. You could, but I wouldn't heat it up too much. You know, I would just, it's more about air movement with this stuff now. So if you have it, like if you, like when I'm priming these things with the Autoborn sealer, uh, what I do is I spray them and I leave them in the booth with the, with the, with the booth running uh, after I'm done with the coat. And that keeps the air moving across. And that's really what helps the, the solvents essentially evaporate from them, the, you know, the water and everything. Uh, but yeah, no, you don't have to heat them up anymore, which is great. All right. This is uh, coat number three. So what's going to happen is you, you, you'll notice this, obviously, mostly when I pull this off, when the mask off. But um, yeah, just breathe heavy on it. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's going to kill me. Why can't I remember the name of that paint? It was the only game in town for like mirror like chrome paint. And it's going to be something like mirror chrome. I can't remember it. I'm going to use the other blade just because this is obnoxious having all this mask on here. It's very cool though, this stuff. It's like all like shiny now. Um... Oh, you know what? While I'm waiting for this last or this coat to dry, I think I got one more coat to put on this. So, but it is, it's like the last coat is what really shows up. Uh, he hasn't been recommended for a while. Good air movement is the key. There you go. Simon's got it. Yep. Yep. I mean, you can, like I said, you can use... Uh, again, if I was using a hair dry hair dryer, I would not have it on any higher than low, uh, and I would keep it pretty far back. Again, warm air is great. You know, 70, 75 degree air is uh, is is perfect for this stuff. And uh, but the days of having to heat it up to like you know warm to the touch type of stuff like you used to, uh, those days are luckily gone. So. And that's mostly because of the paint technology. So now, yeah, now it's really starting to light up, which is great. All right, I think we're ready for the last one. And that last one is what's going to give me all the coverage. Again, if I did this on a really smooth surface, like if I use the high gloss black, 
then that shine would have been even more crazy because right now you, there's still some you can still kind of see the divots in the um, the sanded primer which takes away from a little bit of its glow uh, but still it's fine so i gotta let that dry um, well, I sort of got to let that dry. I can't really paint on it till it's dry, but I can remove the mask at this point. So we're going to do that. And you'll see the difference between the, the silver paint and the base coat. So I'm just going to split it there and pull it down that way. That is lovely. And when I move this, you'll see what I mean about the, the shine. There's a new system using old technology you're talking about they call it designer chrome. That's interesting. Oops, I dug into the bottom layer of tape. This isn't terrible, but not really what I wanted to do. Now the uh, you know the, so let me um while I'm finishing getting this masking off. And so everything is the same when I leaf these, when I use the gold or the silver, aluminum or copper leaf. But instead of using the paint, though, what I would have done is I would have sprayed, um, where is it? I would have sprayed the gold sizing on it. This is water-based gold sizing. Uh, so you spray it. And then what I would have done is exactly where I'm at right now. I peel off all the mask. And then the next step is to take the, the leaf and just lay it down on the glue. And then, and then you, after a few seconds, you can brush it off and you're left with the, the, the image in leaf. So that's kind of, like I said, it's the same method I use for the gold and the copper leaf and all that up to this point. And then the only difference is really, which I'm not going to do here, is um, with the gold leaf and the, all the leaf paintings now, what I do is I will spray... Uh, a coat or a couple coats of UVLS satin on it. And what that does is it kind of seals in the leaf and kind of binds that edge down too at the same time, which is really nice. Hydrochrome, that's not it either. Damn, it's gonna hit me. I'm sure, yeah, but I'm sure hydrochrome was, was a thing. <sighs> ah, I'll, I'll remember it. Uh, now, so this is what I got, which is really cool. So it's like metallic silver and it's super clean. You know, it, it moves around. It has all that fun stuff going on with it. And it's ready to go for the next step. So the next step is going to kind of be doing some sort of background to it. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the details on the actual logo. Uh, and uh, yeah, this one will be done. So super cool. So I just want to make sure that that's really dry before I start messing with it. Um, yeah, I really want to make sure that's dry because what will happen is here's the thing. Next step is this. So I take my cutout again, I put this on top and then I spray the background and do all the background stuff. So if I put this down on here and obviously this is wet, I'm going to leave marks in that pretty chrome and I don't want to do that. So I really want to give this, ideally it, I need to give it about 15 minutes to dry. I was just trying to, the reason why I was hesitating there is I was going to try to think of um, how I can speed that up a little bit and believe it or not I can speed that up by uh, adding a little bit of satin on it, UVLS satin. So we're going to do that. It, the painting gets a coat of UVLS satin on it anyway. So I can do that now. Just get a little bit of that, put it in the uh, Grex. I'm going to call it Hydrochrome. Ah, oh, what was the name of that shit? Bugs me. Now I know this may seem a little counterintuitive, spraying another layer that needs to dry on this, but what, what's happening is though, the uh, UVLS satin is a, is a lot more durable. It resists scuffing and it resists, you know, just damage. 
more than the silver. So by putting a layer of this on there, it's going to make that silver much more durable. Uh, when I started spraying sizing, I discovered pretty quick you have to you have to have a brush dedicated strictly to sizing, because if you don't clean it out the brush, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, so sizing sizing is glue for anyone who doesn't know. It's what it's what they use to get. Um, cr uh, go leaf or whatever to stick to whatever they want it to stick to. So it's basically a glue. And glue in airbrushes is not a great thing. So yeah, you have to make sure it's cleaned out. The water-based stuff is a blast because it cleans out. I just use regular, well, you rinse it out with water and then I clean it out with rubbing alcohol. So it's pretty neat stuff. Still have to build it up a lot though. One more coat of this and I think uh, this will be ready to rock. I should totally be doing this in the spray booth, but we don't have that kind of time. All right, I am going to move a little bit of air over this so I'm to speed it up. So my, <laughs> my, my workhorse, my poor workhorse, which is my sizing gun and my sizing brush, my bulk brush is this Poor Iwata Eclipse CS. This thing, uh, this thing gets put through the ringer. Um, it's I replaced all the the nozzles and needle in it with a 0.5, which is out of the bigger bottle feed. But this is what I would use to put sizing on because it's a bigger nozzle and it just it's it literally this brush is like un, indestructible. Uh, so this is the brush I use for all that. All right. Yeah, uh, also, it was also. Oh, dude, thank you. Also was the company that made it, yes. And welcome. <laughs> All right, that's, that's good. So now I've got a protective coating on that. Um, I'm going to get the rest of this silver out of here just so it doesn't end up being a problem in this brush. Yep, it was Alsa. That was the company. And that's, that's, I think they had a full paint line, but that's really what they were known for it back then was this uh, chrome paint system that was an absolute bitch to use. Like it either worked amazing, like it either worked like, like concourse, like SEMA, or it looked, or it looked like total ass. Look at that. Good job. Google Chrome. Nice. Yes, exactly. All right. So that's all ready to go. So the, the nice thing about the satin is it doesn't take very long to dry. And now that's protected. So now I don't have to worry as much about it. I still may get some marks in it, but there's enough going on in this that I'm not overly worried about it. Make sure we're... Yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, the other thing, too, is like magnets on this, especially like if this was really gold leaf, I would have to really put like three or four coats of the satin on it before I could put a magnet on it. Because if I put a magnet like this on gold leaf, when I pulled off the, the mask, believe it or not, the, the pressure from the magnet would leave uh, an indentation in the gold because it's the gold is so thin. Uh, this is, you know, obviously paint. It's a little bit more durable, so I don't have to worry as much about it. But I still want to be careful with it. You know, I don't want to run into the, you know, issue of putting marks in it that I'll have to fix later or whatever. So I want to line this up carefully because I'm going to do the background. I don't need a whole bunch of magnets on this. I just need, like, the main points. There we go. All right. Thank you again, Jake. That was awesome um, for the ALSA bailout. I think I'm going to um, do the regular background for this. So the regular background for these 543s is like kind of a black fade, black to whitish fade. So we're going to do that. Again, it, um, it gives a really cool kind of interesting background while not, um, you know, not taking too, too long to do. So first thing I got to do is I get some white in one of these brushes.
Oh, it is so good to be back because everything is where I need it to be, which is fun. Uh, that's interesting, too, that... Wait, DuPont bought also, right? Because DuPont is absolutely massive. Or unless also is massive and bigger than DuPont, but I thought DuPont was gigantic. Um, but yeah, that makes sense. And Hot Hughes was... God, there were so many... Uh, so many, like, custom paint lines. So... You know, there was Alsa, and then and then obviously House of Color, and then House of Color was bought, and then um, God, it was endless. You know, everyone seemed to have one. PPG had um, had their own custom line. All right, so this is just white. Again, I don't have to be. I, I really should be holding this stuff down, which I probably could where like like this is right here so that it doesn't really get underneath. I just got to kind of be real super careful because I, I don't want to, obviously, I don't want to put a, a like a remask this to do the background. Um, so I just want to kind of keep it as simple as I can without getting too much under spray. If I get a little bit, that's okay. It just kind of like puts it all, you know, kind of kind of blends it all together. But I just don't want a ton of under spray. Oh, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Well, I'm glad John is where he's at right now. It's And it's amazing that, you know, that guy could easily walk away. You know what I mean? He sold House of Color, and, but he's always out there. He's out there all the time. You know, he's still he's still vested in, in the brand, and it's just, it's good. It's really good. All right, so next thing is black. We'll go the opposite direction with the black. And what that does is it just kind of sets things off. The top part is the shiniest part the bottom part is the darkest part of the logo so we're doing exactly the opposite with the background and then it helps everything pop off so this corner up here introduce a little bit of black and just you know lightly fade it into the the bottom section here and that gives it just enough um, I was going to put a, you know, kind of a drop shadow on it, but I, I think it looks better kind of standing up. Well, if I put the drop shadow on it, um, it it's not, it's going to read like it should be this way, which I don't, I don't really want. So we'll leave that off. And now I just carefully take these magnets off and we should be in pretty decent shape. Yeah, we're good. All right, so now the fun part. The fun part is actually, yeah, you know what? I got a little bit of an underspray or on, on this little spike here, so I'm going to take that off. Fortunately, the underspray doesn't have a whole lot of stuff holding it on, adhesive, you know, from the binder or anything. So what I can do is I can take a kneaded eraser and just really lightly go over that. And what's nice is, again, because I hit this with UVLS satin, there's clear on this. So all I'm doing is taking the overspray or the underspray off the clear. The kneaded erasers are nice because they're, they're just aggressive enough and I can shape them to do whatever I want them to do. Sometimes you need something a little bit more aggressive, but then you start getting into the, in the realm of, you know, starting to, like, scratch the paint and all that. So I don't want to do that, but... DuPont was getting out of the paint industry when the whole waterborne legislation came down. They still exist in name, but they're owned by Alsa. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I didn't realize Alsa was that big. Uh, yeah, back in like the 2000s, before all that, because PPG ended up buying uh, EnviroBase, which was the European waterborne system, and, uh, and they ran with that hard. They're, so they're still, obviously, that's one of the biggest waterborne systems out there now and uh, it was great we did a lot of work with that stuff in the beginning it was it was interesting really interesting stuff I'm happy of just a kind of a more user-friendly like the create tech stuff caught up um, and it's much more user-friendly for for people like me who like when I was doing the EnviroBase I was fortunate that you know I, I was able to have uh, access to a mixing bank 
But if I had to buy a liter of pigment, it was like it's like regular automotive paint. It's like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So it would have made no sense for me personally because I would never use that much paint, you know? So anyway. All right, so that's that. So now we just kind of get into some of the darker details. Now, when painting on chrome, like to get, like I'm going to get this to look like, you know, it's got all the shadows and everything on it. The one thing I can't put on this thing is highlights. So if this is just a gray painting, I could use the white for the highlights like up on the top. But on this painting, I can't do that. And the reason why is because the, the reflection qualities of that paint. If I put like down in here where there's still a little bit of white paint on that, see how it's dull? It doesn't shine anymore really, or it shines less. So if I put a lot of white for a highlight, it'll look great head on, like it'll look good from here. But when I tilt that, you'll see all the shine everywhere except where I painted the white, and it'll actually turn gray, it'll turn dark. So it'll have the exact opposite effect of what you want it to do. So when you're doing it this way, what I do is I just paint the dark parts and leave the rest of it. Anywhere there is highlights will be the silver. And uh, it works out pretty well. So we're going to start by doing the inside, I think the, the edges of this thing first. <clears throat> Excuse me. John Kosmoski taught me how to spray candy. He was in the late 60s and I imagine he's well into his 70s or I think he's in his 80s, yeah, early 80s. And he's still painting and teaching. Yeah, it was great. I got to meet him uh, two years ago at Coast Airbrush. He had come in for the rendezvous and he was, I think he did a small like one day class with, with, with everyone. But yeah, he's still, he's still out there. He's still doing it. It's amazing. Um, this image that I got offline was just kind of a 3D you know rendition and it's it's very kind of I don't know there's a lot more in this than there should be I think someone was having fun with the uh, the chrome button so we're gonna kind of adjust it and make it look a little bit more realistic like all these reflections here don't really need to be there <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do because I'm assuming a lot of this is gonna fall out if I try to cut out everything I'm gonna kind of pick my battle so I'll pick this edge right here first yeah it's funny because all that all the stuff all of this custom paint you know like really like airbrushy you know and then and then custom car colors and everything that's Really, Kosmoski revolutionized the way that we get paint for that kind of stuff. And then, of course, you know, kudos to guys like Frazier in the late 90s and early 2000s that, that basically reinvented it for artists. So, pretty cool. All right, so this edge here I can get. What I'm, what I'm avoiding is, like, where edges are too close to one another, where uh, I, I can't really cut them all out because then I'll just kind of have pieces falling out where I don't want them to. So this one here is far enough away from everything. Actually, this one here is probably far enough away as well. In fact, I don't even need the whole thing. I just need the bottom here. So for this one, I'll just cut this out, but not all the way up because I don't have to go very far on it. I just really want this bottom section right here slide that up and then I'll just fold that out of the way so that that indicates that I'm supposed to just kind of do a little fade there what else can I grab I can grab this one I might be able to grab a bunch of these I was thinking a lot of it would fall out but I think yeah there's no reason why I can't get this one either Oh, that's why, because it gets awful close to that one. Okay. That's all right. That'll work. What else? What else? What else? These two I want to leave. These two upper ones. Oh, I'll grab this one up here. And like I said, you know, half of this painting is just prep. The, the actual painting part is going to go real quick. All right, that's good. That's a good start. I'll leave these two, these two here, these two edges for the next one. Get this out of the way. I still have black in the brush, so we're ready to go. Patty, what's up? 
Excellent, Patty. Excellent. Have we, not, have we not been focused the whole time? You guys can yell at me if I'm doing dumb things. No, because it, ah, see? Give me a second here. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Look at those nice people having a birthday party on my camera. You know, I've had this camera for a year and I still, still figuring it out. Yeah, I'm gonna jump back to manual focus just because it's doing what it needs to do. All right, I'm gonna line this one up. Same deal here. You know, I just want to be careful when I'm putting any magnets on the the chrome part of it. I just don't want to, I just don't want to damage any of it because trust me, I've done it. I've done it where I've put the magnets on there and left this big circle in the gold or whatever. So I don't even want to take a chance with that. The painted part, the background part, is perfectly fine. And I know that's bulletproof because it's mostly um, Audubon Sealer Gray, which is, which is amazingly strong. So I don't have to worry about that. But it's just the uh, anywhere where the, the metallic part is, I want to be careful with it. All right. Really, really simple. So the light's coming from the top here. So it's anything that's like you know, anything that's aimed this way, like these edges down here, these have all the light to them, where anything like that's that's underneath this, so would get in a shadow, gets all the gets all the darkness. So, for instance, the this part of the A starts out really dark, and then just fades as it goes down. And again, you know, it's going to be really dark up at the top here, but I just really take my time with it. You know, I don't have to. I don't have to blast it in. I don't have to like, you know, get it in one shot or anything. Just kind of take my time and just drag it out. And that will give me a nice fade on it. So this guy here, technically is just the opposite. It should, it, the bottom part should be light. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of darkness there just because it helps set off the front of it a little bit, even though it's not really what should be happening. So I'm not going to go super dark on it, just enough. And you'll see when I pull this, it'll, it'll add. But this here, this top part is dark, and then it's light down the bottom. Same thing with uh, the one underneath is all, the, both of these are just dark because they're definitely underneath the logo. Make sure I don't get any paint on this part right, right here. So there aren't any parts on this where it gets completely blacked out because I want to still see that silver even in the dark spots. All right, so that's all good. Yeah, same thing up here. I'm going to add a little bit of darkness on this, this one up here, even though it shouldn't really have any because it's full light. But again, I want to kind of set it off from the, the, the front of this thing. So we're going to add a little bit of darkness to that just to kind of do that. And it's great. When I pull this off, it'll immediately kind of have the structure done for this thing. So it's fun. It just now it looks like it's like really there, you know? I just gotta do the bottom, you know, these these two spots in here, and then the face of it and, and we're done. So alright, so those guys, these two, the top parts here, same thing, gonna add a little bit of stuff. And hopefully you can see what I mean about the, you know, I took out all these chrome, those chrome lines here because they just don't, they don't do much for the, the image, you know. It's like chrome clip art. It's like what AI would do, you know. So I'm going to cut out this bottom one here, which you just saw off the screen, and then this one, yeah, this one here.
the same thing. These two here, they're th they get the full light on them, you know. But uh, but I'm gonna kind of play around with that a little bit just to uh, just so they'll show up where I need them to show up. So we'll line this back up again. Good. A couple magnets. So for this one, I'm going to do the, the right-hand side of each spike. I'm going to kind of just use that to set the front of it off a little bit. And again, on these ones that are like should get should be getting full light, and I'm just kind of doing my own thing. I don't want to go too dark. I just want to get enough of it on there so it pops a little bit. Okay, so now all you have left is is the uh, the front of this, and then to clean it up. And what I'm going to do for the front of it is I'm going to have to cut out just the front because I'm going to want a pretty clean mask on this. Um, so it's not going to take too long. And what? I am doing dumb things. I'm always doing dumb things. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I would almost guarantee it's a focus. I gotta, uh, I'll try the autofocus again. I don't know that it's any better. I think the autofocus tries too hard. But uh, yeah, all right. Let me know because the other thing I gotta do around here is, um, I have a pretty decent monitor to see what you guys are seeing, but I need a really good monitor. I, I, I thought I would just need something to kind of make sure that everything is, you know, in, in the center and that kind of thing. Um, however, I'm learning quickly that, that I need something that's like really like high def so I can really see if it's in focus or not. Because, I mean, I'm finding, you know, the, the autofocus on, even on my, the big camera is great, but it isn't built to operate so close. You know what I mean? It's like a, you know, it, it's even with the, the, the macro lens on it, it's like it, it doesn't really know what I'm asking of it, you know. And I know that's mostly user error, um, but... I find that, you know, once I've had the best results so far, just kind of picking a spot for it and then locking the focus in and then leaving it. Mr. Garcia, what's up, pal? Okay, good. Sounded. Thank you. Yeah. If you guys do notice it, let me know. You know, if it's, if it's ever not in focus, yeah, let me know. And, uh, I will uh, make adjustments. Again, the monitor doesn't show me as much as it should. So that's going to be the next, the next, well, there are two, two bigger investments coming up. One is a, I keep talking about it, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what is the best uh, microphone to get for doing the videos. Not the live, because I like the, I have a lavalier mic right now, which I really like, but for doing like, you know, the pre-recorded videos, I need a I need a, a better microphone for that. So I'm kind of looking at, you know, a bunch of different kinds. I pretty much narrowed it down. I just have to find out which, you know, version of it um, will work best for me. But the other real, the, the other, you know, larger ticket item is going to be a much better monitor. So the problem is, again, I need something that's super high definition, but also small because it needs to be right next to me at the at the workstation. Um, so I got to figure out what what the best way to go is with that. All right. See, that didn't take too long. And that's it. So that's just the face of of the uh, of the logo. 
what's so funny is, you know, I'm doing all this stuff, you know, I'm going to come out with a piece of art in the end of it. But seriously, with, with 3D imaging and, and um, you know, 3D graphics and everything, someone could do this in a 3D program in no time and, you know, they'd be all done. <laughs> but again, what's nice about this is an actual piece of artwork. So not that digital art is not art, but, you know, it's a di this is a different thing. So just line this back up again. This time, got a bunch of magnets on here. Now this, this spray out is even easier than the last one because all that happens with this one is there's a gradual fade from the bottom to the top and that's it. And then the, the airbrush part of this is done. I don't have to do any more. I just have to tie it together with a little bit of paint brushing. So grab the airbrush, kind of look at this thing at an angle. Actually I want, where do I want magnets here? I want small magnets. Yeah, especially that's it exactly, Simon. And and again, with what I got going on, when you know you're dealing with like this, this is your frame of reference. The camera, like as soon as my hand gets in the way, it refocuses onto my hand because it's like for for the camera, like this is like you know standing next to me, and and this is like way in the distance, like mountains in the distance. So it just gets all wonky, and I haven't quite figured out how to, you know how to program it essentially so that it, it does what, you know, I need it to do. I'm going to put a couple magnets on this part because I want to keep those little spikes clean on the top. All right, again, really light, just kind of move up this thing slowly, probably drop another magnet here and here. That's good. I want to come up about halfway and then I'm just going to stop because I want that top part to be just silver. I also don't know really how dark I want this, so I'm going to, you know, put a couple coats on there and then I'm going to remove the magnets down the bottom and just take a quick peek at it, see what it looks like. Again, I'd rather have it more subtle than not. That's, that's too subtle. <laughs> I can't see it. But uh, that's a better problem to have right there, you know, to say, okay, I need to put on a little bit more than to um, realize that I just hosed it down and now I, I'm screwed. Especially with this. If I go too dark with this, I mean, what am I going to do? I'd have to repaint all the silver to reset it. It's not like I could touch it up. All right. I'm not going to put any more on than that, even though I'm thinking I should, but I'd rather be on the rather be on the light side. All right. Lovely. Lovely. All right. Yeah, and that's the thing, Astral. You know, an airbrush can still produce a smaller droplet than a, any any printer can. Which uh, trust me, I know this because I found this out when I'm when I was trying to get reproductions done of my work. Um, it's because my stuff is super small and when you reprint it, it looks like garbage. So I did find a printer that has, that has their stuff down and he does a really, really good job. So my prints actually look like the actual painting, which is remarkable, but still there is a difference. There's a three dimensional difference in, in, in the, in the piece, like the actual piece from the painting. It's neat the way that the paint works. It's just hard to describe. And again, that's what makes my stuff immune from all the AI stuff. I feel bad for the artists that are getting hammered, getting all their stuff ripped off. For me, it's they would just have a really small picture of like you know Cincinnati, and that would be the AI art. You know, for so it, you completely lose everything that my art has by by reproducing it that way, which I love. I love that. All right, next thing, really simple, is just to put a couple little, you know details on here let me throw this on nope that's not what i wanted at all that's what i wanted no that's not what i wanted at all this is what i wanted yeah Dwayne, i agree with that too um although you know i work super hard to get rid of those imperfections because i want it like crazy perfect but uh you're you're 100 right and that's again that's why real art you know, actually human made art will never go away because people who appreciate that is because it came from a human. You know, it's not just that it was done fast. Yeah. Commercial art is, you know, is just going to be decimated by, by all the AI stuff. Um, 
Oh, the camera moved. That's why I'm like, wait, what is that? Um, yeah, yeah, commercial art is going to get decimated because, you know, companies don't want to, they want the bottom line. They, they want stuff fast and cheap and they don't care how it shows up and they don't want, they want to be able to do revisions without, you know, without paying for them. And so AI is just going to, you know, blow that up until, you know, they work out the copyright stuff, which is going to be interesting because currently AI is just ripping off all kinds of artists. So there's that, but let's see what happens. I could have jumped completely to the digital world. I do some digital stuff when screwing around and bored, but for me, I got to keep my tools in my hand. It's just me though. Yeah, I, I am. I actively avoid anything digital, not because I don't like it. It's exactly the opposite. I think if I get a good painting program, I will be lost. I will love it completely. I love the fantasy digital art. I love everything about it. And I think if I got into it, excuse me, it would be a rabbit hole that I would not come out of. Um, so no, I have a huge amount of respect for the, for the real digital artists. Um, yeah, it's just an amazing thing. So, but again, it's a totally different thing. All right, so I'm just going to use a couple of different combinations of blacks. You know, I'm going to, again, I can't use any white on this because the highlights won't work the same way. So really what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clean up a few things on this and uh, this will be ready to rock. So this is a pretty graphic image, meaning, you know, it's just really kind of, kind of there. Uh, we need more light. There we go. Uh, I'm going to just pick some of the darker edges and just kind of accentuate them. So do basically what the airbrush was doing. So I start out with a real thin line and then I kind of darken it up as it gets to the top. And then this will just give those corners and those edges just a little bit of punch to kind of pull them out. Plus, if there's any misalignment, which there isn't too, too much in this, there is up here, for instance, on the top of the A inside top of the A. If there's any misalignments like that, I can, I can straighten those out too. So same thing, I just start with a really super thin line to get it started and then just build it up as I get up to the top. And then there's that misalignment and I can just kind of fill it in. Now the care that I fill that in is dependent on the project that I'm doing. If it's, uh, you know, like the razor blade painting, which I did the same kind of thing yesterday, I would take a lot of care to make sure that that repair, that fill-in, looks exactly like the fade. For the 543s, again, they're designed to be super quick. So, um, so I get them done, but I, I don't, you know, go nuts on them. So this, I missed pretty hard on this one here. So I'm going to have to kind of do a little bit of, a little bit of jazz. which means I got to kind of, again, punch that, that edge in and then bring it up to where it should be. Same thing here is a little bit of repair down here. And I kind of missed the whole thing. It's like a, it went a little bit farther south than it should have. So I'm just going to have to fill it in. Paint is a little bit too wet. There we go. Same thing over here. I missed a little bit there. So again, it's just a playing the game of straightening things out and making it look the way it should. Same thing. I start that right out here, really thin. You can't see it. Just yell at me. There we go. So yeah, this this point right here doesn't really match up. So I'm going to start kind of out halfway. And the brush dried out on me. And then I could just continue it on into the shadowed area and then fade it out, like sharpen it up and fade it out before it gets, you know, too far in. That I actually like down there, the way those kind of line up. Yeah, this one here needs a little bit of love. Like the misalignment, 
I don't know. You can really, I don't know if you can see it, but the misalignment right here actually works really well. It acts. It looks like a like a like a cut edge. The same thing right here. So I'm not going to fill those in. I'm going to leave them because they they look they look the way they should. But like this white he, right here, this one is pretty pretty you know pretty bad. So we'll just kind of finish that up. In the end, you know, even the mistakes. I want the mistakes to look intentional if they don't they, they got to come out you know it's like mistake like like you know bob ross says you know happy happy little accidents or happy mistakes that's fine and everything if in the end they look they look like you meant them for me anyway you know i, I mean i don't know it's just i don't know it's just like like i work too hard at this to just be like oh well you know whatever happens happens But, you know, yeah, accidents are great. It's, that's when you learn. You know, you, you t pick up a new technique because, you know, something went sideways but actually did work. So the next time you can actually do that and make it real. So now, all right, I would love to start putting in white highlights in here, but I, I, I can't, again, because if I do that, it'll look good from this angle. But when I tilt it and it gets nice and shiny like this, those white highlights will turn black. But right now it's got this cool sheen to it. And I like that. Uh, the Japanese digital artists get really ripped off and are struggling to survive. Yeah, Astral, I, I feel so bad for, for any digital artist now because that's the first, you know, the, the first attack is all those digital artists. They're, all their stuff is getting just totally hammered. So thanks, Patty. So that's it. So that's how it works. So what I'm going to do with you guys is I'm going to put the first coat of UVLS satin on this. Uh, it's going to take... Um, Usually with these um, 543s, there's, there's about two or three coats of satin that I put on them to get them to the final shine. Don't forget, this one's already got kind of one on it already. And manual focus is not on. It's autofocus. Right, right, right. Look at, see? What's it doing? I don't know. Stop it. That's not focused, camera. That's not even close. Anyway, there we go. <clears throat> I still have um, UVLS in the gun. <coughs> Excuse me. Yep, I still got UVLS in the little tritium here, so we're going to use that. In fact, I'll add a little bit more. Now, again, this should be done in the little spray booth, but we're going to do it right here just so we can kind of see it, and I'll show you how I kind of... It's basically really simple. This uh, tritium has about a uh, three to four inch spray pattern. I want to go 50% overlap on this, and I want to keep it not, you don't want to wet the surface, you just want to kind of um, kind of get it on there, you know. So, again, this should be in the spray booth, but I'll hold my breath. That's it. So now it's got, that's wet, but um, it, what I have to do, the reason why I'm mean, not gonna do all the coats with you guys is because that now definitely needs to sit for about 10 to 15 minutes to totally cure. And, uh, and then I can apply the next coat. Now, there's a big difference, and I talk about this, I think in the UVLS. This has UVLS satin on it as well, but you see this finish here is like super clean and super like smooth and shiny. So the difference between when I use it on a painting like this and the 543s, the 543s, I'll just spray them twice and they'll be done. This, I've sprayed it four times and then I sand the, the, the coat with a thousand grit sandpaper and then I spray it again and I sand it again and then I sometimes I even hit it with the, that, that scotch bright again. And that's what gives it this really flawless, super smooth coat. And for those who hadn't seen it, Put the light on it so you can see it. Refocus. This is the Cincinnati painting. All done. You guys are too dark too. For the jumbo, uh, let's go lighter. There we go. So yeah, so that's how the Cincinnati painting came out. And I love the satin because it gives me, you, you can't see it head on, which is nice. 
but then at you know at an angle you get that you get that just that satiny kind of glow and it's got the um and it's got the protection like i you know i, I could i don't want to but <laughs> um i could do bad things to this and um and it would just sand out you know and then i could re-clear it as long as i don't get down to the paint um, you could do a lot to keep this looking just like this so the next thing to do for this one is i'll cut another aluminum panel uh, that's just a, a hair bigger, like a sixteenth of an inch bigger, and I'll go leaf that, and that'll this this will sit on that, and then this will go into the the frame. But and I'll peel off the plastic, this little protective plastic on the back. So which which is actually it's supposed to be the front, but I leave it on the back so that when I'm done, you get a pretty painting on the front, and the back is just perfect. So there you go. That is your 543. So now you have you have a, a leg up on everyone else. Except oh, you know what I forgot to do, but it's okay. Make sure that's dry. It's not cured yet, but it's dry, so I can sign it. Normally, I would sign it beforehand before I sprayed it. There we go. So now, when I spray the next coat of clear, that'll be locked in. But there you go. Ah, uh, Chris, thank you. Yeah, through Emily's eyes. That's that was awesome. This one's called through Carol's eyes because it's uh, Carol High Hightower, Highsmith. Sorry, Carol Highsmith is uh, the photographer who took the photo of Cincinnati. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, all right, where am I at? I think that's it. I think it's what I got. Oh, let me switch over. We got this. I got this in the way. This is in the way too. Not for long. That's in the way, too. I'll turn that off now and get that out of the way. All the stuff is in the way. All right, so thank you for hanging out with me on this Thursday. Again, if you're interested in, in any of the pyro red paintings, uh, jump on that today because tomorrow they go back up to their, their regular price and they will stay there until they're gone, which is, uh, which is cool. So if you're interested in one of those paintings, they are original, like full blast paintings. They just... Um, they were controlled in, in, in that I, um, I was able to do them in a certain amount of time, which allowed me to, even at the full price, they are half the price of a normal painting. But uh, again, what I did was to kind of get those moving uh, before I started the next series, I took even more off. So they, they will be at that sale price until tomorrow um, if you're interested in that. Um, other than that, that's what we got. Uh, we are back on it. If you having fun with the razor blade painting, come back Wednesday. We do the premiere on Wednesday night at 8. And uh, I will be back Monday. Now I will be back with five new 543s. So I'm excited about that. And uh, that's what I got. So to all of you guys, thank you so much for everything you guys are doing. Uh, hope you have a great weekend. And hope you enjoy your leap day. And uh, that's what I got. So I'll catch you all later. And thanks for everything. I don't know what button to push. It's been too long. I have no idea what I'm doing.